Okay. Okay, folks, let's come back. We're, we're going to be signing books. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're going to be signing books after the uh, panel discussion is over at noon. So just to let you know that, that we will be here to, to sign books. And we're going to ask, have you asked more questions. But John uh, had a very important question, a very interesting question that comes up a lot. And uh, I thought we would open with that. He's been working and he's not talking. OK. Um, somebody handed me this. I get this question a lot. Would you explain, and if so, how a soul in spirit can be reincarnated and yet send a message through a medium? Because a lot of people say, when I go over there, how do I know if my mom's going to be there okay, if, if they're reincarnated? Yes? You understand? Okay. A lot of people want to know that. Yes, I get that question all the time. And a medium gave, gave me this answer. Okay. You know, you all, most of you are computer literate, yes? You know, there's a hard drive. The John Holland program just spit out and it's playing now, okay? The John, Hall, the John Holland file is playing. When this John Holland file is done, it goes back into the hard drive, so that John Holland program will always be playing, but another piece of my oversoul will come down here. So that John Holland program will always be there for people that want to contact the consciousness that was John Holland. And Rob said the same thing about um, you, 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 I said, what's your view on, you gave, I got your view first, and then I said, well, this makes sense, too. So use the hard drive as a, as a use the computer thing as an analogy, and I think it, right. does it work for you? And, and yeah, it does. Also, also too, uh, Hewlin Casey uh, used to say that, you know, logically, you know, we, this goes against all logic because, you know, we're in linear time and space, and so we can't fathom being in two places at once, when in fact, you know, if you picture that there's an oversoul, um, and that there's five different uh, yous in five different places at, at once. I mean, um, all of the uh, saints that, that the Catholics pray to, you know, for guidance, all of those people I know have reincarnated because some of them got readings from Casey. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, the essence of who they are, of who we are, continues to live on. You know, even though the soul can reincarnate, and again, this can't be really fathomed in this dimension, but suffice to say, we are in many dimensions at once, and the essence of who we are uh, continues to live on. In fact, Casey said, there's a reading that said, part, there's a part of us that never left the face of the Creator. That there's a part of us in spirit that has never come here. So we're looking, like if you picture a mountain, and there's a, you're at the top, and there's a cloud cover, and you cannot see anything below that cloud cover, you know, and you think that, that that's like the end of it. Not only is there more mountain, but there's life on that mountain that goes all the way down. And to me, that kind of is a emblem. Yeah, and you said, because we're thinking in linear time, I was on a cruise ship with Suzanne Northrup, and she was in room A, I was in room B. We had the same spirit given the same s different, different readings from the same spirit in different rooms at the same time. Now, how does that happen? Right. I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> The same thing I said on Friday night. When you move down that tunnel and come to the place of light and meet the being of light, that being of light is really you. Bring in your higher self. I talked to you, gave you a whole discourse on the damn atom. It's 98, it's 94.6 percent empty space. So when you're thinking of you can reincarnate, there's only five percent of you that ever left heaven. Just what Rob was saying. If you're 98 percent. 98.6% empty space and only 5% physical based on, a, on atomic structure. And the multi-universe theory, if you just look up the multi-universe theory, describes exactly what the possibilities. You only manifest 5% of you, and the rest of you stays in heaven. And remember I told you the analogy of sticking your hand in gloves and pouring chemicals and, and spending a lifetime as a, as a neurochemist? and it's poison, and you, when you die, you just take your hands out of the gloves, and you look up, and there happens to be a mirror in front of you that you haven't seen all day while you were working with your hands in those buckets, and you stand up, and you see yourself. So 98% of us never goes anywhere. It's a constant part of the entire universe, and in certain mental, physical planes, we focus our identity so that we can grow and achieve and be a vessel for bringing love and appreciation and divinity into this Plane. And that's, that's 
Beautifully, beautifully put. Beautifully, that's beautifully put. Excellently beautifully done. Beautifully Give put. me a hand. Beautifully put. Because also the, also the idea is that, you know, if, it, if we were not focused, you know, on this system and if there was a bleed through of all of these different channels, we would not be able to focus on here. So there appears to be boundaries and there are boundaries for a reason, you know, for our sensual, sensuous, sensual input. I didn't mean that the way. What and boundaries are these? <laughs> anyway, <Wait> question. <laughs> for Danian, since he's got his mouth full. <laughs> Would you please give us your vision of the Twilight Brigade and tell me where I can go to get trained? If in the final 5,000 years of a 26,000 year cycle, and what the rotation is to Earth moving through the uh, precession of the equinox, the last 5,000 years is the recreation as of, to value the 20,000 years before it, each, each astrological sign. So in order to be per per perfect in the fact that three-fourths of the Earth that was supposed to be destroyed because of how many is supposed to be here, blah, 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 blah. And when I had my third near-death experience, I stayed in the blue-gray place longer than I ever stayed in the first two times because the first two times I thought I was the only fool there. But then when I stayed, I could see these, these levels of consciousness. And I knew that one day, because of war and murder and pestilence and what we're doing to our planet, there was a good chance that place was going to get clogged. And there'd be so many souls trapped in there for so many reasons that people couldn't get to the tunnel. And I figured I'd better unclog that, that space there, like the well of souls in the Bible, when the well of souls pours itself out. Well, when all the well of the souls pours itself out, where the hell does it pour itself to? And it's this blue-gray place. So I created the Twilight Brigade. Knowing that I know what's next, there are psychologies that create the finest being a listening, loving presence to bear witness for those in transition, to help them move through that blue-gray place and get to the other side, and maybe because of the techniques I used, that they would light the way for someone similarly trapped, and there's a lot of veterans over there, a lot of people who served in combat who went through some horrendous stuff that they can't face themselves to go down the tunnel. I mean, it's called PTSD and delayed PTSD, and we all know about it in veterans and those situations. So I created this program because that way, under trained, disciplined troops, the Twilight Brigade, spiritual beings will come to the call. And if I train you over here to help you get people past that veil, and then I have people I've already sent on the other side, I know they'll come to meet them. So I know there's a hand reaching out from over there to help me bring my Marines, <laughs> Semper Fidelis, and those men and women who serve this country, who we already all owe anyway. And now you just go to Danion and go down the links and go to the Twilight Brigade. And there's a whole website about my stuff, where you go, what you look at, how you deal with these issues, how you volunteer, what it takes to set up a program. You know, I have a, K, uh, I have a place in Asheville, okay, a group in Asheville, and I just grow them as I can afford it. And remember, all of you guys are paying for it. The money that you put forth to come to come to this seminar and the books that you buy go to support the Twilight Brigade. I mean, it gets most other than the expenses that I had to eat dinner last night, which was joyous because John came and was nice to me. Okay, so you go to, the, you go to Daniel and go to that link. And there is that world. I always laugh and say I have a split personality, but both of them are public. And we all owe... 60,000 veterans are dying every 30 days. 60,000, in the next two years, it'll be around 90,000. And they're alone because most of them have PTSD and they've alienated their entire family because they was drunk, high, or tripping, or just basically war transforms you and turns you into a complete asshole. And they're alone and they're scared. And all they, they, all they do all day is either stare at the television I take as much dope as they can. I deal with who they killed. No spiritual being ever initiates the thought of murder 
in its base core nature. And we have a defending a country where we murder. And they are trapped there, brutalized. And I just decided that's what I would do. And I would pick a population that I'm one of them. So just go there. And everybody, I, wanna, I want you to all really help me. And, and thanks. Because look, if the ARE is an institution that's based on a lot of principles, and I already talked to Rob about this, and you lifetime members, I'd like to do a training here. And we bring our lifetime members together, and we bring the people, and it's not to promote Casey's teachings, but if you know them, you're going to know the right time and the right place to say the right word. And Rob's been studying death, and you know, it inspired him in those early years because I knew him when he was a little boy. Well, 12, 14 years. Yeah. He's a little boy searching and looking for his way in it, and he chose a way that he found in Raymond and me and, and George, and he really put the Casey stuff into depth, and he applies it himself. I don't know if you guys understand how proud that makes me of myself, but if you got any idea, I'm feeling pretty good about myself when I look at Rob and where he is. And so if we took the ARE, and we deal with veterans in the issue in a time of war, just like what he did when people were coming in World War II to find out about their children. Where's my child and my husband and will he come home? Because he was reading those 10 and 12 a day and it was killing him and everybody saw it killing him. But he kept on because it was the desperation of trying to know it World War II. Well, in that heritage, ARE can step to the plate again. And we can step up and we, we may not can be Edgar, but we can outreach. Absolutely. And we can go visit people. And we got, this is Hampton Roads, it's the Navy. There's plenty of dying veterans around here. And look at what we can do to grow ARE. Practical application of these principles at a time most needed because we're in an insane war and PTSD is becoming the issue and the problem. And I have a section in my manual. I teach you about PTSD. It's common basis. There's a tape you have to listen to in the training designed by the VA. And so I want this really bad. And Robert and, I tr Robert and I tried to start doing it 10 or 12 years ago, okay? But everybody here was crazy. Then they were. They were going through a period of evolution. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and there was freaks. I, I, I have to add something here. Uh, when, when I um, was in Martinsville, Indiana, this little town at 17 years old and that I knew I had to get out of, you know, I had had a very traumatic experience. And out of that, you know, I wound up with this book on Edgar Casey, and something in me said, "Hey, you know, college was not an option. You know, we didn't have the money for school, and plus, I was an idiot on paper. I barely passed high school, uh, truly." Go Navy. And, and and something said, "Join the Navy, and you'll get stationed near ARE in Virginia Beach." And don't you know, out of our company of 80 people, I was one of two people that got stationed on shore duty in Norfolk, Virginia, and I wrote to Hugh Lynn, and within a month of being here, I get a handwritten note that says, call me, come and see me. Pure coincidence. I am so grateful to Hugh Lynn and to Daniel and Lynn, because I used to come and see Lynn, you know, long before she even knew who I was. She was one of the first people who I came to see. And She's still trying me. to figure out who he is. I, so it's really amazing to me to see how all of this, it, life is really magic, but what Daniel said, there are a lot of people who do need help. And as a veteran. Knowledge here. There's a lot of knowledge out here that can be applied that glorifies the teachings and the readings and also outreaches into the community that because ARE's people are meeting, somebody won't die alone who served and defended this country. And if you know what PTSD and end of life, 70% of all veterans who's ever served in combat. Post-traumatic stress, post -traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder. The ultimate stress factor. 70% of all veterans who have ever served in combat, if left alone, will fight the war. I mean, they'll be trying to kill Germans and get out of windows and breaking windows out and screaming. Or they're dealing with the issues of killing children and dogs and pigs and blowing up stuff and watching what they saw in war. They don't deserve that. And so they can go to your website and just go to Daniel and go to the Twilight Brigade, and there's everything that you do. Great. Thank you, Daniel.
Um, I have a question, not even a question, a statement. First of all, thank you for illuminating every person in this room. And I know that that happened. And what I, I, I don't want to get emotional because I hate that. But it's what good I for you. I know, but I don't want to do that. So what I feel for most people here is they keep asking about their, their, de their ones that are dying. And wh how can I help them? But what about helping ourselves? What about, ugh, what about taking that process that you had beautiful people in your life and you're going to lose them? And I lost four in two years. And that's not, I never, I did not know what I was going to do. And how I found out was through a very, you know, I took a time where I just felt my pain. And I felt sorry for myself. And I hated my mom. And she's still a bitch. And I'm going to kill her when she gets there and when I get there. <laughs> but you owe it to them. You owe it to yourselves, more importantly, to have a beautiful life. It gets better, and it's been 13 years, and it's, get, it's illuminated me, it's gotten me to a really great place where I can give back and give my soul and my heart to the people that are hurting. And I still hurt, but I hurt for your pain and for your suffering, because I promise you, you will have the best people looking out for you better than anyone could talk to you. When you believe and you have the courage and you have the ability and the strength that no matter how you were treated, that you're going to live a better life and you're going to have people up there that thank you for forgiving them and thank you for being, you know, I was lucky. I had good ones and they all went all at once and Danny told me, well, you just burn them out. That's why they went. I mean, I was like, why'd they all leave me? You just she burn them out. She was telling um, the story and I was looking at how beautiful a person this is. Yeah. I, yes. I love Nay and I love her, and she's opening her heart for where a lot of us are. So but I'm just saying, I'm not mad anymore. Well, what point. I'm saying is that each and every one of you still have a beautiful life ahead of you, and you need to believe that. And those people, and you'll see them again. And the thing is, be really good now, because the ones that you don't like, I don't ever want to see some of these two girls on shore drive ever again. <laughs> so I, d I can't forgive them, <laughs> but I'm not... <laughs> One cuts her face, and I was going to send her a box of sh uh, Schick or Gillette or Bic. I'm not which, sure which yet. And I still have that human quality where I want to beat the hell out of someone because I'm a flight attendant. And you don't think I have to deal with this, some of this stuff every single you day? You know, um, I've, I have Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, really. <laughs> you know that. In between now and when you see those people you can like or hate, buy and read our book. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they don't call it the work for nothing. <laughs> I'm telling you, I mean, it is true. And I talked about this uh, the first night of the, the program. Um, just the idea that sometimes, you know, we want to skip all of the mess and, and it's like, okay, forgive them. Okay, well, there's a lot of space between the anger, the hurt, and the pain to forgiveness. And Catherine Marshall, I love this prayer. It's like, you know, um, we are all wounded healers. If we were not wounded, we would not reach out to help anybody else. But she had a prayer that's just simply, Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. Sometimes you have to pray, Lord, give me the ability and desire to forgive this person. If you have to start there, that's a good place. You know, but there's so many people who think, no, 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 no. You know, you got to, it's like, it's a process. It's a journey. And I rem about anger, I remember Casey saying, he who never gets angry is worth little. He well, he who, likes me. He said, "He who gets angry and does not control it is worth less." Oh well. <laughs> okay, I have a prayer. I have a prayer. And if this guy in AA, which John was talking about, the AA section, this guy in AA brought it to me because something I had said either made him laugh at himself and it helped him, and he said, "Daniel, think of this." It is unbelievable what the unbeliever has to believe in order to remain the unbeliever. <laughs> it is unbelievable what an unbeliever has to believe has to continuously or has to believe in order to remain an unbeliever. Never underestimate the power of denial. Yeah. In other words, in people like that, <laughs> right. 
um, getting back to helping others in, in little ways in, in a, during the process of our lives. I did something years ago that uh, I automatically was doing all the time and never really thought much of, but I sang and danced professionally when I was younger, and we got a group together. She used to open for Johnny Carson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> she did. <laughs> But we got a group together. I was uh, in uh, Miami, Florida at the time. We went over to the VA hospital. And all the way over, I'm thinking, well, what can I do? You know, I, I, I can't help them. I'm not a nurse and all that. But s there were some people who told jokes and some who danced. And, and uh, I got up and I sang a, a song. And I'm just going along my merry way. And all of a sudden, a young soldier came running toward me got up off his chair and ran toward me, and I got frightened for a moment. I didn't know what he was going to do. He stood in front of me and saluted, and then turned around and went back to his chair and sat down. And I just kept singing, you know, right along. Wow. And later on, one of the doctors came up to me and said, because I thought, what was that all about? What was the song? He came, oh, um, I think it was You Made Me Love You. Oh. I think that was the song. And he, the doctor came up to me and said, you're not aware of what you've done. I said, well, what was that all about? He said, that young man, since he's come back from the war, has not moved, has not talked, oh my almost couldn't hear anybody. He would look at you blank. He said, that's the first time in all the years he's been here that he got up and moved. <laughs> so I, we don't wow. know, you know, we can help many people in many little ways. And those little ways are, it's everything. Yeah. I what mean. What kind of outfit did you have on? <laughs> 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 I mean, I, let's, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> okay, uh, Dano, it's Freddie. Hey, hey. Look, uh, this thing about the anger really touched me. And, um, Her angry? No. Oh, me angry. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> All right. And just the anger. I was a fundamentalist for a long time. I went to Bob Jones University for four and a half years. I was a senior Bible major. And it's the most damnedest, angriest place in the world. <laughs> Fundamentalists are angry. <laughs> so Did it was a. Talk to women on campus there? Oh man, they don't no. let you do nothing. They they would ship you for immorality. I mean, they're equal opportunity shippers. I mean, if you touch, you know, whatever. But uh, I'm I've been I'm here on this incarnation to process anger. I think I've been a warrior a lot of times. I can't verify this yet, uh, but I think I died in Pickett's charge. I was at Gettysburg looking at the, uh, yeah, I was lit at the cops of trees, and we were talking about the reenactment, and it came out of me. I died in Pickett's Charge. So I've held a sword a lot, and I, I'm here, and now I'm sick of war. <laughs> you know, I'm down here now, and, and uh, there's so much anger to process out, and I've had so many angry things happen to me in my life. And, uh, the that was because of Jesus. No, yeah, that, that, that had a lot to do with it. Yeah, I, have, but I was young and idealistic. But my, my question is, how do I bring those people along? There are so many, many, many millions of people trapped in fundamentalism that, that are not Pharisees. They're being taught by Pharisees. Is there good stuff? I'm just starting to read this stuff now. I've got a long way to go. Read our book? I, I'm getting there. I, I've read yours. I'm, I'm, I'm on your latest. I've read John. I, 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 I. Lynn's going to answer you. Well, I don't know if I'm going to answer it, but I'll comment. I'd, yeah. Thank I'm you. going to. Uh, re <laughs> I'm going to refer again to the work of Ken Wilber and another another uh, writer who talks about something called spiral dynamics. Any of you familiar with spiral dynamics? Uh, popularized by Don Beck. Uh, it's the notion that the totality of who we are is made up of a spiraling of value levels. 
It goes all the way from the tribal to the highest levels of the transpersonal. The entire spiral is necessary for the health of the whole. There is a place on that spiral, there is, a, there is a place in human development that is the mythic membership level where fundamentalists are comfortable. That is the level they're on. For them, it's working. Yeah. And the, you, you, as you honor, the, there's each level of the spiral will tend to think that all the others are wrong and not be comfortable with them. No. But then, yeah. <laughs> Don't that. But, well, but then <laughs> I would have shot that damn dog. Okay, but <laughs> but now here's the thing. There is a leap. There is a leap to second tier, which is the integral level of thinking, <coughs> where you honor every level of the spiral, recognizing that it is a necessary part of the ongoing, never-ending <coughs> development of all that is. <coughs> And just as you were once at that level, and you have gone to another level, the greatest gift you can give now is to still honor those who are still at that level and recognize that that's where they need to be. Or burn down the university. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I've thought that, about that. <laughs> and that ability, that ability to recognize that there is a, that's why, that's why part of the insanity of what we're trying to do in the, in the Middle East is to go into a largely tribal culture and introduce a level of values that... That they don't want. They don't they want. Don't that's they not don't where want. they are. And so trying to address fundamentalism in, in like trying to change someone. E Edgar Casey, they asked this question, what, what do we do um, for people, you know, who are, you, you know, in this mindset? And he said... If a dog chooses to return to its own vomit, let it. <laughs> so basically, he said, "We're not. Don't try to convert. You know, it's like do not ever try to argue, convince, or persuade. It's like, like Lynn said, they're at a level of development where they need to be. You have gone up the spiral, so that all that energy that you have can be transformed in the most." Brilliant creative energy, unless you look back. I wonder what Edgar had for lunch when he came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, it's and, from the Bible. And here's, here is the thing. The last level before the leap to integral is a pluralistic level where you, you value all points of view, but the interesting thing is, the little sneaky trap is, you value all points of view as long as they're points of view that are all also valuing all points of view. A lack of tolerance for those who don't value all points of view. That, and Wilbur describes this in detail, he has called it boomeritis and says it is the, the uh, condition of a whole generation of us. And boomeritis has great promise because we see something beyond what went before in many cases. But the limitations are that it is nonetheless a very rigid value system that says, unless you are inclusive and pluralistic like we are, you're wrong, you have to change, you're no good. It's a very sneaky thing. Yeah, it's like being intolerant of the intolerant. Right. Being intolerant of the intolerant. Um, you spiral back, dynamics. Um, Wait. Many times when, when people come to see me or another medium, something may come out of my mouth and it's so specific, and you're going to want to go home and tell your partner, you've got to believe this. You have to. And the husband or to the wives will be like, as long as you're happy, dear. You know what I mean? <laughs> Everyone, I, I, I keep telling people this. Everyone is exactly where they're supposed to be. Right. Okay? And I always joke and say, would you want to be with another one of you? <laughs> would you? Absolutely, but Fred, if you keep, no, no, if anyone takes a psychic development class or whatever class and you become a little more enlightened, and Fred, if you trust in what you're believing, you will attract others. It's, it's the law of, attraction. law of attraction. And you can't go in there and say, you've got to believe this. Just like a wife can't go home to the husband and say, you've got to believe John Holland. And I say to them, they're exactly where they're supposed to be. Maybe put a book out, but... You know, Fred, you can't go to the whole university and say, this is what, you keep being the good person that you are, and you, you will attract it. Because the gentleman said, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. It starts with it starts us. With yes. Start playing John's book, 
quietly at night while they're sleeping. <laughs> We're all exactly where we need to be. I have a question. Um, I would like to know where Raymond Moody is and what he's doing currently. Raymond, um, I, I did a program with him in, in Palestine, Texas last year, and um, he was still doing seminars and lectures. Did, have, have you seen him recently? I've seen him in September at Omega Institute. The Omega Institute. So he's still out there, still working. He's a dad. And, um, he's Beautiful kid. Taking, yeah, he and his wife have... Uh, he's living in Anniston, Alabama, thinking about moving to Florida. Rain Man, I always called him the Rain, rain man. man. The Rain Man is the Rain Man. He never believes anything. All his friends are dead because they're Greek, Aristotle, Socrates. You know, so he has no new friends. Most of his friends have been dead 3,000 years. He loves ancient. He's a philosopher. You know, he's wonderful, and he's still into psychomantium research, and he's always on that front line. And what makes him so wonderful is his Ph.D. in philosophy. And one day in a class, a kid talked to him about near-death experiences when he was talking about philosophical parts of death. And then he met George. Richie. And then his life began down a path he hated because his intellectual self would not allow him not to entertain repetition in the, the basic anomalies in the near-death experience. Because so, um, he was a hardcore atheist at, at the he time. Just hated he, his, he just hated his daddy. Yeah. You know, remember, he wasn't he all that. He's the kindest. He just hated his dad. He's the warmest person in the world. He's, he's had some health problems, but uh, when I saw him last, he's, he's feeling much, much better. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about this whole issue of how do you deal with an atmosphere of fundamentalism or a mindset that seems so impenetrable. It reminded me, uh, years ago I worked in a psychiatric hospital and I had an experience that I've never forgotten. Um, I had a 14-year-old boy who was very, very angry and had, I don't know if he was psychotic or not, but he obviously felt like he was. And So he was in the quiet room and he was um, in some physical restraints so he wouldn't hurt himself or anybody else. And he was raising hell and carrying on and cursing and I'm, I'm sitting in there with him and I'm, I kept trying to like tell him, you know, <laughs> you breathe, you need to calm down, you know, and, and it wasn't working, you know, and so just then somebody came in and had mail for him. And uh, where I worked, that was the belief that you kind of interact as much as you can no matter what's going on. And he's cursing and carrying on, I don't care about that. And, so I opened it up, and it was a um, it was a um, card from his aunt. It, in the front of it was a little teddy bear, and you open it up. It says "Get well soon," <laughs> and it just kind of clicked something, and he just started laughing, and so did I. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Well, it was also how it was. Um, Sort of an understatement for where he was at, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, very good. But um, it shifted the paradigm, I guess. And I, I think, I, I guess a question I have is sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with um, impenetrable situations, um, isn't it helpful to try not to, to try to... Uh, wait for questions. Yeah, d don't give it d offensive energy. I mean, it's like the more we, you know, it's like there's a thing that says resist not evil. And that means like the more that you um, worry about something or agonize over something, it actually b makes it greater, you know, in power. And in actuality, you know, this impenetrable fundamentalism, when you look at it, you know, I, I men mentioned the first night, it's like, We've got, although they're not necessarily great shows, but we've got Ghost Whisperer on television. We've got Medium on television. We've got directors like M. Night Shyamalan and visionaries like George Lucas. And it's Sabrina like, and, and I mean, but we've got, but we, we have got at the mass level now, it's like you were talking about the unbeliever. You know, you have to live, to live in a cave and choose to live under a rock to not be exposed to this, uh, higher thinking beyond fundamentalism. So really, it's it's 
a part and parcel, but actually there's more and more people. Most people I run into are open to these things. He ain't been to Mississippi lately, everybody. I ain't going to Mississippi. That's, that's part of that downward spiral. I'm sorry. So I'm not, can I get John to make sure he tells the rain man that everybody in ARE sends our love to him? Uh, I, I know what you're talking about when you're a fundamental, a fundamentalist. Uh, I was born and raised in Kansas. My wife calls me her Kansas hick. Uh, four years ago is when I really started getting into this. And some of the ways, because <clears throat> I thought everybody could pick up a book and read it and understand it, and then I found out that wasn't true. But what I have found when you say like does attract, like, I drive a school bus. I can't talk to these kids about this knowledge that's out there for them. But I can carry that book with me. I have a book with me. John Holland, Sylvia Brown, I'll have Damien's out there with me. I carry a highlighter. I cannot check out a library book. Damien's my brother that makes them all <laughs> But I will, <laughs> I will carry a book with me and a highlighter. As I read and I find something that really strikes me, I highlight it. I've had students, grade school, element, elementary, junior high and high school get on my bus and say, oh, what are you reading? I'll say, well, here, why don't you read it while I drive you to your bus stop? There's some things highlighted you might like to read. So if you carry a book with you and somebody says, oh, what are you reading? That person has been drawn to you. Yep. And it works. Sure you take it back from them before they get off the bus. Oh, definitely. I only have one door. And unless they go out the back door or out the window, they can't get off the bus without it. <laughs> But also taking a book to like uh, a, a doctor's appointment or if you're on an airplane or you're waiting somewhere. I mean, more times than not, when I'm flying somewhere, you know, I'll have a, a book that I'm reading that's, you know, uh, esoteric or whatever. More times than not, I will get into a really great conversation with the person sitting next to me. And they will say, this is so strange. It's like we were supposed to, this was supposed to happen. And I'm to hear this. I'm read my book from here on out, everybody. <laughs> I leave my book because we get them <laughs> cheap from the publisher. So my bo new book, because uh, I talk about synchronous. Who is your I will publisher, leave by the way. Hey House. Oh, okay. So I will leave my book on park benches and you know, yeah. in airports and hospitals and so, and and I write. You're meant to find this, and then someone will be like, you know. But to address this gentleman, I was in Texas, and a woman came into my workshop. It was at the crossings, and it's a spa. And one of my students invited her. She wasn't part of the program. I started doing readings and. She said, I said, are there any questions? Are there any skeptics in the room? Any questions? She raised her hand and she said, which I usually get from people who are with the Bible, and she, she said, where are you getting this information? <laughs> okay, and I said, you know, and I said, look, I believe, Mary, I said, I'm getting it from, I'm getting it from the spirit on the other side. Do you believe in spirit? Yes. I said, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, Mary and I are tight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Lord's Fatima, I was raised Catholic. Doesn't she end up getting a message out of all the people there? She was one of them, and it was her... I said, okay, I'm getting something about a suicide, and who, there's nurses all in the family, three nurses, and she's, and she's going white, and she says, wait a minute, my uncle's name is Robert, I'm one of three nurses, dun, 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 dun. Then when I found out who she was, I said, I don't understand, why are you skeptic? And she wasn't even supposed to be in that cl class. I got absolutely upset that somebody let this woman in. But my students, because I'm always learning, said, John, maybe she was supposed to be there. So didn't she get her world rocked? And she must have went out of there like, I, 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 you know. <laughs> and she, you know what I mean? So what was that all about? So maybe she was supposed to be invited to that room, you see? And what happened? Spirit used her, brought through a message from her uncle who committed suicide, talked about the whole family. And now she's going to, I don't know, it's going to be her free will, my friend, to say, that's the devil? Or maybe because it was so specific. I work out of love when I do this. Absolutely. And I'll be doing book signings, and this happens, and I'm okay with this. They'll have, they'll say, I was in Australia, and this guy is following me, and he says, do you mind if I sign, you sign my book? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. It was the Bible. <laughs> and I said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> this isn't mine. And he, and he says, if you, weren't afraid of t if you weren't afraid of it, you'd sign it. And I just said, sir, oh. I was raised Catholic. I am not going to write on your Bible. And he would just, and he, magic markers yeah. <laughs> and he just, <laughs> 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 and he just, 
And he <laughs> <laughs> I'm not at that point yet, okay? I'm not at that point. But he just shut it and walked away and he was quite proud of himself that he found another, you know, demon, okay? But yeah, so that woman, you know, she was supposed to be she was supposed to be there. <laughs> yes. Good question. Okay. Okay. Oh, Okay, she gave me the microphone, which is really nice of her. I just wanted to say, you know, the great thing about all this stuff we learn is we understand it or we think we do, and we still go out and we have bad tempers and we sure. do things that aren't good for our bodies and things like that. Um, something I've always accepted is that you do sort of sign up before this life for certain experiences and patterns, even though once you're in it, you think, How, why would I do that? Why would I choose to be with those people? or whatever, but I'm wondering, since we do have free will, something that can feel so shocking and so anomalous, like a suicide, you know, if you've had that in your family, which I have, or indirectly people I know or my children know, um, I wonder if it's possible that, like, you didn't really sign up <laughs> for that exact thing. Maybe <laughs> you, you um, accepted the possibility of something like that or something, or if it can be just, so um, it's just, just so there's a so blueprint difficult yeah, because you know, I'm also working on a Department of Justice project in correctional facilities and worked in. I right, hold on now. Take a breath. Okay. Take a breath. I worked in. Well, I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I'm, I'm okay. One okay, okay. No, wait a second. Okay. One at a time. What you're describing is personal guilt. Mm. Well, put a person when you're talking about children having okay. to happen around them. Okay. I'm listening to a person who's describing where she sees she's responsible or not responsible. Because guilt when around suicide, and this is where you are, guilt around suicide is a heavy burden for all of us. Most people who have had people suicide, they feel guilty because they didn't do enough. And then they go off into tangents, and then they go to thinking they're going to hell because they listen to what religion says and all that. What you do is you realize that you're not personally responsible. Like you drove someone to suicide, but you qualified this conversation with free will, okay? Free will, you set potentials. Nothing's carved in stone. You have potential, like, like in quantum physics, you have a proton potential of a series of possible events that'll happen. So maybe I can go along with, you didn't sign up for all of them, but the potential of what you were thinking and doing recreated it maybe to help you and those kids First, don't put so much pressure on yourself. And second, you're not responsible for anybody suiciding that you didn't do enough or that the kids didn't do enough. And what it feels like to me is you're overlaying those who died in your family, overlaying to what your children have put themselves or been going through watching kids kill themselves, and you're compounding guilt. You're not responsible for it except to tell your children that whatever those situations that created, because it's already happened in your life, don't dwell on what you think you could have done. Don't dwell on the issue of the guilt that you think you have because you didn't do enough. Kids don't understand, but they feel like they're responsible. And you as a child, watching it happen in your life, built that same psychology. So today, maybe you didn't sign up for all those potentials. The only thing you were guilty of is being smart enough to see that you need to approach and think about that inside of yourself as you watch it in your children. Well, that's actually very helpful. Thank you. But I guess what I'm thinking is even though I understand that this this lifetime is like an illusion and death is an illusion and all of that, well, there's a having something like yeah, that happen just brings you into the physical so much. Well, the know, thing is there's a, there's a blueprint of, of things like uh, Edgar Cayce in, in, in one of his lifetimes, he said, we have those things which have been, which those things which are and which have might have been. So in a given life, you know, there's like major things that um, – that you choose to work through. But your relationship with all the other people, it's like Daniel said, you're not responsible for what other people do. Uh, it, you know, we are free, free-willed beings and we can divert completely from that blueprint. It's like it's not set in stone when we're going to do this, this, this. Uh, otherwise, we'd be robots. Right. So we can make creative choices that divert completely from the pattern that you're in the place you are, you can mentally drive yourself crazy trying to figure it out. The yeah. thing is, it's not our job to know why this happened, where this happened, and what this is for. 
you're in the place you are to do, you know, to be a positive influence where you are. But to try to figure it out or why this is happening will just... Which is trying to help the children, Rob. Right. You're listening to a child who experienced a suicide in the family who as a mother is now watching where her children are. And how I, I was just trying to express that as a free-willed being that you're not... Anyway, I, well, I, I just I, I know that the whole system is too complicated for us to understand, or for even really into it, people like you to articulate. It's just you know when something like that happens, and the person who did that doesn't really obviously comprehend how damaging it's going to be for the people they leave behind, and it just it's sort of. Um, you know, it's like you're between two worlds when this happens to you because it you know all of these of things are, are, are illusions. And on the other hand, you've never been more aware of yourself as a physical being because you realize you do have the possibility to cause great destruction. And, you know, but anyway, I, I appreciate what you said, Daniel. Did you want to? Okay, thank you. I was just wondering, I'd read Daniel's uh, book, Peace in the Light, and he talked about centers for stress relief, and I just wondered what was happening with those. And the centers, if everybody who's the Danian legend, and Saved by the Light, in 1975, 76, when I came out of this, it took me like a year. When I came out of it, I had a certain series of visions called the Boxes of Knowledge. And one of them, there were two things that I was supposed to do. You know, I always tell everybody, all that crap in the world that you read about is just details. Daniel, was there anything that when you were over there, they told you to do? And it was spiritualistic capitalism, and it were the centers. And I think that the real means test of Daniel is if I said those two things, which I did, and they've been around since 1976, and if I have worked on them, and the last of the centers. Well, I didn't realize the brilliance of spirituality. You know, I still don't. But I realized that what they were trying to get me to do was to people to take their causes and their hopes and to create a mindset that business could operate so that you could see through godless capitalism and non-socialism, but you could, could bind the access to wealth. My spiritualistic capitalism is the book sales and the tours and the lectures that funds the program. And then I've created Veterans Care Plus. As Rob or everybody in here who's ever served in the military, this, the son bitches lie to you from the first day. You're a handy wipe. They use you once and they throw you away. And then everything else they promised you in the bill and when you signed to take that oath, you don't get it. You know, and I'm thankful for when Rob went through what he went through with the VA in his back. I'm thankful for the quality of care that he got. I mean, there's not me criticizing the VA. So I took and created the Twilight Brigade so that I could take the Twilight Brigade and I put my, got myself on the National Institute for Health Board of Compliance and Alternative Medical Policy and the White House Commission and then the White House Council in studying integrative therapy so that I could take my volunteers and put them into a controlled health care situation. The VA is an HMO. They just paid in advance. And to take a health care system and integrate through that health care system my system of understanding from the near-death experience and what they told me to do with the centers. So if you're a veteran, if you're a Compassion Action volunteer in the VA, you are considered a complementary therapy. So I outsmarted the FDA. My volunteers are considered a complementary therapy. So by creating a 10-year program of the human touch of being at the bedside, I set a standard and a validity that that system would understand and it would have to appreciate. And then I would put the center in the VA. Because if I had a vision, and I, we were talking about this yesterday, if I had a vision, I expect that those people who gave it to me, that I would analyze the data, and I would tactically lay the attack plan, and then I would lay waste to the enemy. You know, I fight wars of attrition. So here's God. There's two places where there's kingdoms in America. There's Hollywood and there's Washington. I was a defense contractor in Washington, so I'd pretty well worn it kind of thin. <coughs> so I went to Hollywood. Because if you want to make an impact, you get three or four movie stars, come to see some veterans, and then you get a person in the center program, and they had a mother come to see them, and then they let go, and they don't hold on with all that desperation and fear. And then you have a Compassion Action volunteer there. And so what happened now is in the place in the VA in Sepulveda, where the hospice program is, 
there is one of the largest post-traumatic stress syndrome programs in America, 2,300 veterans. So remember, if you read the book, the, the centers were about stress management. So all of a sudden, God has put me in, in Sepulveda VA. I'm going to run simultaneous programs. I'm working the funding right now. I was on the phone Friday negotiating a contract to get the funding so that I could do the two studies. And then I will put the system in place in a 30-year project using the VA as my verifying qualifier to take a vision and to make it work in the Veterans Administration. I have to tell you, coming from a defense contractor, I kick somebody's ass. <laughs> and then they go, once that's proven, and then they go public. I want one here. I want one right back up there. I mean, I want one at the Heritage Center. I, you know, I want everybody to use these tools because we're at the close of an era and we need to get past all this stuff and get to the part of recreating the world we've come to do. And the centers are, are really the groups of people that you've gotten together to go to these places? Well, it's every person's personal center, yeah. but I have to create a building with the beds in place. But it's great, though, that you've, I mean, actually, when you have the people going to these places, that is the, the center. Is the yeah. It's so, and the VA isn't the, slick. it's very slick, very <laughs> slick. The VA isn't the greatest place to have things that, well, in, in Hampton Roads, it, that they need a lot of help. They need a lot of help. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty rough. It's but, pretty we, rough. but we can be that. But I'm glad everybody. they were there when I needed them. That, absolutely. I mean, because John and I would have had to do psychic surgery on him. Yes, they would. And Lynn would have had to hold a light. <laughs> and there's somebody Hi. here I, I will not point out, but was an absolute yes, light being during that process when I was having problems with my back and the healing process and she is here and I will not point her out but thank God she was there point her out no I, I don't want to do that she, she would not want me to do that but just whispered in my ear. <laughs> but just thank you I to her for being there at See? my darkest hour I'm I'm eternally grateful so next hi question. I'm sorry I have and a we're question. gonna wrap up in a few minutes to sign books and and hang out but we're supposed to wrap up be between a quarter till and 12 so I there, have there's to regress over a here. little bit, and I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, but there, there's, after you, there's a couple people over here. Okay. I will go. I just have a question um, directed towards the people that care for hospice. Um, when my dad passed away a month ago, I kind of experienced something really extraordinary, and I wasn't sure if any of you have experienced it, but when we were at his bedside about eight months prior, about eight hours prior to him passing, we had started to talk, my godmother and I started to talk him over a little bit, and um, we knew he was ready to go. My dad and I experienced heat above the bed. It was like almost like a canopy kind of a feeling. No one else in the room except for me and my dad felt it. In fact, he was kicking the covers off, and we were both sweating a lot. Um, it was really, if you could call death a beautiful, it was really almost a beautiful experience. And there was a lot of healing, and I felt other entities in the room. And I wasn't sure if working with people that are dying, if any of you have felt that it happens before. A, it happens a lot. It does. The veil is opening. Okay. Okay, and because of the intense of the love between them and the relationship, you and your dad, then you were, and Raymond teaches a program on this, how to go with them. Mm -hmm. Your natural connectiveness and the security that he was linking his soul to yours and his daughter was there, and the pride and the greatness that his life had value, that here you were. It was beautiful. Then you I could mean, sense the I veil. I wouldn't have expected that. The clouds parting and the veil. I, I, I said in my uh, program, I've been with 364 people and around more than 1,900 within days and hours, but 364. I have 18 stories that I think are legendary. Five are suspect because I could have been too tired or I could have been something. But I have 12 or 13 stories that's just like what she says. I mean, I see people fill the rooms and get up and look around and don't know where they are. Beings, the whole place full of beings. Whoever this person was, they had done so much good that the host of heaven had come to get them. Yes. And then and I've seen one person, and then I've seen family members, and I've seen people having a conversation with somebody in the room, and I can see, I don't see, it doesn't look like grandmama to me, but I can see the form because the light's just right in the silhouette. So what you got to do is to see and sense 
a notion of what happens in the transition stage, and you and your dad, you got to experience what happens when one of us leaves, that sheer ex ex that exaltation that passes from that level to the other when the veil lifts. And it, and it's Congratulations. Actually, yes, it's actually a birth. I, it, it really is, and, and Casey would, would tell parents, like if, they were, if their children were uh, in the process of a transition, I remember him saying, remind the entity of the beauties of the transition. Meaning like to tell them either mentally or to tell them that there are angels surrounding them and that there's a wonderful light. But I mean, absolutely, it's like just, and I said this in the first night for those of you who weren't here, that just like we have, we have a team of doctors and nurses who help us into this world, there's a group who helps us over and they come in. And it is a sacred moment, it really is. And people either experience it as heat and also sometimes as coolness or cold. Like if you're in a house, uh, you know, that's older and you sense like a coldness, that's not an indication of anything evil. It's just an indication of an, an entity. For some reason, the temperature can either drop. Have you found that to be true, John? Well, I'll always tell people, w w make sure it's not the vent. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I don't <laughs> right. mean to joke, but really, people... It's true. Every... Yeah. 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 But you, you did a perfect description. Yep. Of sometimes it's cold and sometimes it's a heat. Yeah. So it, it, people, some people see a light, different I things. I be hot when I'm gone. <laughs> yes. First of all, um, so many things I just want to say. But first of all, just thank you so much for the opportunity here. Um, and the ARE. Well, th I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. <laughs> Hang on. Um, I grew up here. I live in Florida now. And by the way, you need to start a center down in Florida. We're the lightning capital of the world. <laughs> come down. Come down. We need you down there. Because um, there's a lot of old veterans down there. <laughs> Call to serve. That's right. Because um, the reason why I'm here is uh, my mother passed away earlier this month. And I didn't even know that this uh, event was taking place. Um, before she or before she died, but growing up here, my mother was married to a disabled vet and uh, took care of him with a lot of the Edgar Casey treatments. Got him walking, wow. using the almonds and the oil and all of that. That was all part of my life, and I really believe strongly in synchronicity. And I'm not uh, as we were talking about yesterday, and I just want to share this because I think she was called to go home seven 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 at seven a.m. Wow. And uh, wow. because they called me at 6.30 from the uh, rehab rehabilitation center where she was staying. And I got there, and long story short, she decided to hang on another four days to give me that time to say goodbye. It, and it's true, they wait. I know they wait. And I think, and the other thing that she was waiting for was my stepfather, because he had passed away 12 years before on the exact same day. You know. She was waiting for him to come get her? I think it could be. It could be. And did she talk to you about that? Whether well, telepathically, if I may say that, because she couldn't talk. They had put a tube down her throat, intubated her. Somehow or another, she got her hands untied and pulled that tube out herself. I came back. I was gone for like two hours. I was watching her every minute. I was gone two hours to take care of my daughter. I come back. She's breathing on her own. And I had to make that decision of let her go. It's time. You were there was it when she passed? Yes, I was, and my, and my daughter held her hand. Okay, the, for the people in the room who beat themselves up, I should have been there when they passed. Yeah. I could have gotten there when I, why couldn't I get there? You could be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You go to the bathroom, they go. You sometimes go for a cup they, of coffee, they'll go. They don't, sometimes they don't want you to go through it. The soul does not want you to go through it. A mother may not, sometimes they don't mind you being there, and they will wait, but for the people, yeah. And it, Yep, but so the people who say, I, I should have been there, maybe you weren't, you weren't supposed, supposed to, to be, be there. there. And it's, it sounds really. so simplistic to say, if they needed you to be there, they would have waited. And if you weren't there when they went, they were taken care of. But well, she, she wanted us to be there. She Her family to. was there. It was very beautiful. And, and it's inspired me now. Uh, it's given me something else that I want to do in my already busy life. But relating, <laughs> relating to this that I wanted to ask all the panel about, the day before she went in the hospital, I had picked up a book by Lynn McTaggart entitled The Field, um, with the respect field? to the, in, the field. The 
with respect to the intention experiment that she's been conducting relating to Fire the Grid that Lynn was talking about yesterday. I was wondering if you were familiar with that. But before I have you address that, I got one quick question for, for Dan. And are you, you're friends with Art Bell. I read that in the book last night, right? Art Bell's a good friend of yours. OK. Are you familiar with the Isaac material? Is it real? The stuff that came out uh, in the past two weeks about uh, some guy was working for uh, a company that was working on alien equipment. That there, because in your book you say in, in the next year we're going to find out that there is extraterrestrial life. I don't know the Isaac material. I don't know the Isaac material. Mm -hmm. Art Bell doesn't believe anything. Well, he put it out along with no, Whitley well, uh, Strieber or whatever his well name. Well, that's Whitley. Yeah. Yeah. Two Whitley. different. We're talking about two different people. No, but it was on Art Bell's website, well, too. But Art, Art Bell just puts it out there. Right. Uh, yeah, but remember, Art doesn't believe anything. He doesn't. But do I believe in extraterrestrial? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll look at the Isaac material, but if I make sure you have your address and phone number so we can open up a Twilight Brigade, I'll certainly go ask Art. I'll I mean, I, Art, lives, Art Bell lives 50 minutes from my house, and he retired from the business because he has a wife and a little kid at 62 years old. I'm a 24-year-old Filipino wife. <laughs> so he just got him a younger version of Mona. But Art doesn't believe anything. What made Art's bell so wonderful when he began Coast to Coast in Dreamland? He didn't believe any of it. And what he was doing was just giving you a chance to talk, and then he would either pick it apart. If it seemed right to him, he would support it. And that's what made him. And George, George is a believer like all of us. He's just trying to convince himself of something. He never pins it down, but to convince himself of something. But I will ask Art. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm home Thursday after nine weeks. Well, we have a uh, veterans hospital in uh, West Palm in the West Palm Beach area. It's uh, about five minutes from my house, so we're we're yeah, I am done. <laughs> I'm ready to serve. But I really want to hear you guys discuss the idea of uh, the the field of universal energy and how we are all connected. Thank you. Well, that's quite a question that to come at five of twelve. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. Like three minutes too. yeah. <laughs> the universal energy and the connectivity of all things. I have not read Lynn McTaggart's book, so let me just. The only thing I would say about the field is that it's it's another version of microcosm and macrocosm. We all as have above, a so field, right? As above, so, so below. below. We all have a field that is our body. <coughs> we are parts of something greater that has an energy field, not unlike the energy field that we have individually. And so, what we as parts do affects the whole. The whole has impact on us. And also, the internet is a replica, I mean a, a physical, or it, it's not really physical, the internet is a replica of the mind of God. It is eternally growing, yet it does not exist in any space, yeah, and yet it, I mean when you think about it, and we all are connected to it, and yet it of itself, I mean isn't that a brilliant, what, what do you call that, is that a metaphor or an analogy? Well, do on you, that note, do you think that this cyberspace existing place is, is the place the where the Antichrist can speak to the whole world? The other day, somebody <laughs> said, if it's the end of time, no. you better think about it. This guy asked me the other day. He said, you need Dan, to read my book on angels on the Antichrist. Well, you need to give me a copy of it or tell Honey, me where I, I can get one. I gave you a copy one. 10 years ago. Well, you better give me another one. <laughs> I will. If a guy says that, you know, if we're thinking about the end of time and that now we have the Internet and you could speak to the whole world same, simultaneously and you have wirelessness, then the next thing you think is the 666 story. Okay, you know, the mark of the beast. And this guy, he asked me, he said, well, Daniel, what do you think about that since you think it's the end of an era and we're all fighting over Jerusalem again? He said, what do you think about it? I said, 666, very easy. Have you all checked your credit rating lately? Your credit score determines whether you can buy, sell, or trade and at what price you will pay. And the mean number in credit rating of where you have excellent and good credit, and then from good credit down, the mean number is 666. If you're 666 or below, you have to have variable rates at which you buy, sell, or trade. So it's just an interesting perspective to close on, just in case you need a little dirt in your life. And let, let me add by just saying that that which is without, Casey said once the battlefield that was on the outside is now the battle of good and evil is fought upon the battleground of the psyche of the soul. 
So, you know, we don't need to worry about anything coming from without. You know, within we've got enough to deal with, and the avenues through which evil manifests is through the choice of the human will. We have to choose to hate. We have to choose to be prejudiced. We have to choose to be vengeful. Those are the doorways through which evil enters into this world, and it is much more formidable than any outward antichrist, in my view. Just wanted to throw that out there. But thank you all so much, and thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, John. Wow.